Well, friends, good morning and happy Sunday and welcome to Park Road. If we've not met yet, my name is Chris DeVitro. It's my great joy to serve as one of the pastors here at Park Road and to welcome you to worship with us on a beautiful Sunday morning, the final Sunday in a frigid January. Now, I know you all were jealous of the snow that fell in Boston yesterday. And if we all pray hard enough, maybe it'll snow that much here in February. Maybe not. Friends, it's good to have you here worshiping with us this morning in person. If you're joining us online this morning, good morning and happy Sunday and welcome to you as well. It is good to be together as the family of God for worship this morning. Friends, Scripture reminds us that the Lord takes pleasure in His people and He adorns the humble with salvation. And He adorns His people, the humble, with salvation in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, Park Road invites you to love and live like Jesus by worshiping fully, learning humbly, and loving extravagantly. For we believe Jesus is worthy of our worship, and we believe that He has loved us extravagantly, that we might love one another extravagantly to the glory of God. Of God, And it is good to be together this morning to do that as the church family. Now friends, let us quiet our hearts and be led into worship by the choir.
Friends, this God to whom we surrender, this is the God who is worthy of all our praise and honor and glory. Would you please stand with me and be called to worship? Be called to worship will be up on the screens ahead of you. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. And so this God to whom we surrender, this is the powerful God to whom we now sing our praises, for he is rightfully due our worship. Oh 
up your voices and lift up your praise. Join with the heavens declaring the wonders of his faithfulness forever. Sing of the victory, the hope of the world. The Savior has risen, the Spirit has come to bring us into love. seated. Well, good morning, Park Road Church. Every Sunday we take some time to confess our sins and to hear the good news, to hear the declaration of pardon. And that's important because we want to get to the good news about what Jesus has done for us But we have to understand that there's bad news, and that bad news is that we're all sinners and we have a need, and that need is Jesus Christ. So as we confess our sins together, remember that this is part of the good news, is that we were sinners, but yet God loved us and sent his son to die for us. The words will be on the screen here. Let's all confess these together. Heavenly Father, we confess that we often place our hopes in the powers that we see in the world allowing ourselves to be lifted up and brought down by people and institutions that are flawed and fleeting. Help us be faithful citizens of heaven. Hear the declaration of pardon. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Hallelujah. God, we're so thankful for the gift of life that you have given us. Thank you that we are here today to worship you, to hear a word from heaven, God, that you would speak to our hearts through the worship through the declaration of pardon, through our prayer, through the word of God being preached to us, we want you to speak to us that we might know you more and know you more intimately. God, I thank you so much that your word says that when we dwell 
in your shelter of the Most High, and we abide in the shadow of you, the Almighty, we can say that you are my refuge and my fortress, that you are the God in whom we trust. Thank you, Lord, that you will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from deadly pestilence. You said that you will cover us with your pinions, and under your wings we will find refuge, that your faithfulness is a shield and buckler. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to fear the terror of night or the arrow that flies by day, that we don't have to fear pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor destruction that wastes at noonday. God, thank you that in this life we can find refuge in you, that we can seek you and find safety, that we can come to you with our burdens, we can come to you with our pain, we can come to you with our fears, and we can trust you that you are our refuge and our rock. You are our strong tower. You are the God in whom that we trust. So thank you, Lord, that we would live a life of faith in your promises, trusting in your good news, trusting in your protection. And no matter what's going on around us, Lord, that we would not live in a place of fear, but that we would trust you in all situations and in all things, Lord, because you're worthy of our trust. You're worthy of us living a life filled with faith in you, Lord. Now, Father, comfort us by joining us together in one spirit as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Drew. Well, friends, it is our tremendous honor and joy as a church family to be able to support approximately 30 mission partners here locally, nationally, and internationally. And we attempt to bring you a uh, introduction from each of those mission partners once a month. And though this month our mission partner can't be with us in person, but they have sent a video for us to get to know them a little better. Let's watch together. We're excited. If you want to learn more about Scott and Sally and their ministry with the Jesus Film Project, you can see Alan Marsdale. Good morning, Alan. Come see Alan. He'd love to talk to you more about the Jesus Film Project and Scott and Sally and their ministry translating the Jesus Film Project to go out into unreached people groups. But friends, thank you for your support and partnership with Park Road. When you support Park Road, a portion of those funds go right back out to our mission partners, including Scott and Sally translating the Jesus Film Project project. I love what the CEO of the Jesus Film Project said. It's a moment of all play for the whole church, everybody reaching everybody. We all have the opportunity to engage together. And so thank you for your support, because as you support Park Road, we have the joy to support those who go with the good news of the gospel. So friends, thank you for your support. It's great to have you here this morning in person again or online. Welcome to you as well. If you are a guest this morning, we'd love to connect with you. Please grab one of these yellow guest cards. For every yellow guest card we receive, we'll donate $5 in your name to one of our mission partners this month, as you just saw with Scott and Sally. So if you are a guest, fill out one of these. $5 in yours name goes to the Jesus Film Project. If you're a guest online, please email us, info at Park roadchurch.com. We'll donate five dollars in your name as well to Scott and Sally and the Jesus Film Project. Friends, a few things to be aware of this morning. Next month is February. Every February we collect spa items to donate to the moms at Hannah's Hope. So bring in shampoo and lotions and soaps, all kinds of good stuff. You can leave those out in the gathering space. We will donate those to make gift baskets to spa gift to bless the moms at Hannah's Hope. Any questions, you can see Drew and the students. Friends, remember that you can still text and join. You can text nine, you can text, excuse me, join PRC to 94000. We're going to send you two to three weekly text devotionals, really briefly, a scripture verse and a question just to get you thinking about God's presence with you 
day in and day out. This way that God's word can be in your soul frequently pushing you towards Christ. So text join PRC to 94000. Friends, we're also eager to see you engage with God's Word, not just individually, but in community. Small groups are an important aspect of the Park Road Church life. We'd love to get you involved in a small group next Sunday, February the 6th, after worship. All the small group leaders will be out in the gathering space with dessert. I've been told if you feed them, they will come. So go out into the gathering space next Sunday after worship, get some dessert, meet our small group leaders, learn about small groups. You have the opportunity to join a small group. would love to see you get plugged into a small group. If you have any questions, you can grab one of these yellow brochures out on the information table, and then you can meet those small group leaders next week after worship. And finally, mark your calendars for Saturday, February 12th. The kids' ministry is having a glow-in-the-dark party here at church. Liz, is that 4 o'clock? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, Saturday the 12th, kids' ministry glow-in-the-dark party. The good news is if your kids have been acting up, you can lose them in the dark and not come back and get them because it's going to be right now. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Any questions, see Liz for more details. Friends, always you can give online, parkroad.com church.com slash giving. You can get our e-blasts online. Our e-blasts come out every Friday with lots of good information about what's happening in the Park Road Church family. Also visit us on Facebook. At this time, kids up through fifth grade may be dismissed. And friends, let us stand together and prepare our hearts to receive the word of God as we sing together to God be the glory. Amen. Friends, you may take your seat. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. We continue this morning in our journey through the book of 2 Samuel. Last week we saw the account of Saul being killed. And this morning we see Saul, uh, we see David respond to Saul's death. I'm going to call forward Ben Gravitt to read for us 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. Thanks, Ben. Good morning. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he said, it should be taught to the people of Judah. Behold, it is written in the book of Jassar. He said, your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, 
publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Let the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. This is the world of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. Friends, let us pray together. Father, we give you thanks this morning for your goodness and for your faithfulness. And Lord, we confess that we come this morning inadequate and unable to be faithful people. We believe, Lord, that so much of the sin and the error in our lives is as a consequence for trying to compensate for not being able to measure up. And so this morning, Lord, help us to rejoice in our weakness, our infirmity, our insufficiency. Help us to rejoice in our inability. For only, Lord, when we come to the end of ourselves do we see your might and your power. And Lord, this morning, that is our desperate plea to see you as the powerful one. And so, Lord, quiet our hearts and soften our hearts. And by your grace, help us to perceive your spirit this morning. That we will be transformed by your word and by the power of your spirit. God, I beg that you would hide me behind the cross and we would see Christ Jesus glorified and magnified and exalted. And we would see the supremacy and superiority of his sacrificial love for us. And may we recognize that we are a served people so that we may go and serve. So we give you thanks, Father. We anticipate your work this morning. We pray in Christ's powerful name. Amen. In 1883, the presidential historian Robert Ingersoll said of Abraham Lincoln, nearly any man can endure adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Now, what impressed Ingersoll about Lincoln was not the fact that he wielded power, but how he wielded power. With mercy and grace and compassion. And power wielded with mercy and grace and compassion is not the way that we see power wielded today among us, is it? No. In our politicians, in our corporation leaders and business owners, in our Hollywood celebrities, we think of power, we think of might and strength and dominance and imposition of force of strength. We don't think of power wielded with grace and mercy and compassion. 
Yet in 1982, 49 historians were asked to rank America's presidents on a number of categories, including leadership skills, political appointments, political accomplishments, character and integrity, and handling of crises. And Lincoln ranked as the most influential and effective president in American history. And again, a study in 2021 on those similar categories found Lincoln again the most effective president in American history, not because of his power, but because his power yielded with grace and mercy and compassion. And so what was it about Lincoln that stood in such stark contrast to the way we see power yielded all around us today? Thurlow Weed, a contemporary of Lincoln, said Lincoln was so effective and influential because he heard all who were with him and he saw all who were with him. There was a way that Lincoln wielded power that was different than what we see around us, a stark contrast. This morning we'll see a similar contrast of two types of power, a worldly power that leads to death and shame and defeat, and a godly power that leads to life. This morning, our big picture, we're going to walk away understanding the world's way of power is the worst possible way. The world's way of power is the worst possible way. And we'll take three steps to get there. First, a political power that is perilous. Second, a personal power that is passionate. And third, a providential power that is perfect. So the world's way of power is the worst possible way. Perilous political power, passionate personal power, and perfect providential power. Now, last week, we observed David's sorrow over the death of both Saul and Jonathan, and also his sorrow at Israel's defeat in battle. Now, his response was a song of public lament that he wanted Israel to learn. And that's what we have recorded for us in verses 19 through 27. So, a public song of lament to allow Israel to mourn and grieve together. Think here of how Elton John wrote Candle in the Wind to memorialize first Marilyn Monroe and then dedicate to the memory of Princess Diana. A public song of lament to allow the people to mourn and grieve together. But why a public lament? Why did the people need to mourn and grieve together corporately? David uses it as a means of instruction. Uh, There's something that he wants to impress upon Israel that they must remember and never forget. That's why thematically you read three times in this passage, the mighty have fallen. The mighty have fallen. The mighty have fallen. That is the trajectory on which we're traveling this morning, the mighty have fallen. And so first we see the perilous nature of political power. Now remember, Saul was a head taller than any other Israelite. He looked the part of royal, impressive, powerful, imposing, authoritative king. Saul looked like a king, yet where did it get him? Verse 19, your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Your glory, O Israel, is slain on the high places. Now, your translation might read, your king, O Israel, your prince, O Israel, your gazelle, 
O Israel is slain on the high places. The word picture is of a mighty animal of the forest perched majestically on an unassailable ledge overlooking a valley. And yet this mighty animal perched majestically on a ledge that is unassailable has been slaughtered and left for all to see. We think of the lion as the king of the jungle, mighty and majestic with no competitor. And yet when we see photos or read stories of lions who have been murdered by poachers, there's something within our spirit that dies a little bit to see this mighty and majestic animal slain and lying dead. Something within us grieves. And so it was to see Saul slain and laying dead. Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. In effect, David says to his people, such are the consequences of worldly power. We saw last week that Saul lived by the spear. He intimidated by the spear. He ruled by the spear. And so he died by the spear. David says, such are the consequences of life and death by the spear. There is shame and destruction in defeat. Now, to reinforce the shame that accompanied a defeated worldly power, David directs Israel's attention to the Philistine victors. Verse 20, Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. Now, Gath and Ashkelon were Philistine cities. And David directs Israel's attention and says, look at what happens. Live by worldly power and your enemies will sing songs of victory in their streets as we mourn. Such is the fruit of Saul's lust for power. Now, to understand why David draws Israel's attention in this way, we must understand something about the reality, the definition of power. So, just a short course through the philosophy of power. Aristotle once wrote, the beginning of a change or a movement is called a power. So, power basically defined as the ability to exert influence to introduce movement. Okay? The German sociologist Max Weber once wrote, power is any probability of imposing one's will within a social relationship even against retaliation. We're now putting some teeth on this definition of power. Influence or movement even against resistance. One more step, let's sharpen those teeth. C. Wright Mill, the 1900s. All politics is a struggle for power. The ultimate kind of power is violence. Influence or movement against resistance, forcefully so and violently so. Now, what happens when unbridled power is let loose on society? Shakespeare tells us through Ulysses. He says, and hark, what discord follows. Then everything includes itself in power. Power into will, will into appetite, and appetite a universal wolf. So doubly seconded with will and power must make perforce a universal prey and last eat up himself. Power, when let loose on society without any guardrails, descends into a self-consuming rage. 
The shadow side, the depravity, the downside of power is that it is an unchecked movement that forcefully positions for influence against resistance without thought to consequence and ends in a self-consuming rage. I'll say that again. The downside, the shadow side, the depravity of power is that it is unchecked movement that forcefully positions for influence against resistance without thought to consequence and ends in a self-consuming rage. Now, we have seen that interpersonally. We have seen that societally. We've seen that culturally. We've seen that politically. And so, the movement for power, the desire for power, what Foucault called the will to power, it ends in destruction. So, we talk a lot in the church about how we leverage our resources for safety and for stability, for security. We talk a lot in the church about how we leverage our resources for our identity. I wonder, friends, how we leverage our resources for influence. When you need to get your way in an argument, when you need to get your way and you're in line waiting for something, when you need to get your way and somebody disagrees with you, where do you turn to make sure you get your way? What is your means of influence? How do you exert power so that you get what you want? Now, 2,000 years of philosophy have taught us what David already knew, Psalm 20. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. When you need to get your way, what is your chariot? What is your horse? In what, in whom do you trust to get your way in a particular situation or conversation or argument. What's your means of influence? Now David continues, and his lament continues to recount the shame of Saul's defeat. And it's both to remind Israel of Saul's folly, but also almost as a motivation. Uh, Anyone in Texas will shout, remember the Alamo, right, as a means of motivation for future conflict. The Israelites would have shouted, remember Gilboa, the shame as motivation for future conflict. But then David shifts his attention. And he shifts from the perils of political power to the lament over a different kind of of power loss. David now laments the loss of passionate personal power. In verse 25, we read for the second time how the mighty have fallen. And then David's attention shifts. Jonathan lies slain on your high places. And here David is addressing Israel. The corporate lament. But then his his spirit, it speaks, and he turns inwardly. He says, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Now, let's be careful and let's be clear. Last year in 1 Samuel, when discussing the relationship between David and Jonathan, we said that Scripture is in some sense ambiguous about the nature of their relationship. 
This is not one of those instances. Here, the context is overwhelmingly and abundantly clear to support a God-honoring and God-glorifying friendship between David and Jonathan. Notably, understand the context. Marriages were often arranged for convenience and political reasons. Marriages were performative. They were used to surrender and to accomplish political alliances. David and Michael, David's first marriage to his wife Michael, was a political arrangement. And so frequently, friendships provided camaraderie that marriages did not. In our context today, we think of spouses as best friends. That's a relatively recent development. It makes perfect sense that David's wives would not have provided the camaraderie that Jonathan, his friend, could have. Second, notice that the Hebrew word that we translate here as love has consistently strong political and diplomatic connotations. It was a mutual love born out of a shared struggle in Saul's court. This was an alliance love a love in a shared struggle. And so this diplomatic love they had for one another makes perfect sense. Because remember that Jonathan, as Saul's son, was the rightful heir to the throne. And so how did Jonathan act as rightful heir to the throne? 1 Samuel 18, Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David. Jonathan gave David his royal robe and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Jonathan gives David all the royal vestments to give to David his royal authority. Jonathan's love for David was a sacrificial love. Jonathan loved David. Jonathan had power, and Jonathan gave it up for David. Indeed, Jonathan was a constant, steady, and God-focused presence in David's life. 1 Samuel 23, And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Jonathan was always a steady, firm, God-focused presence in David's life. Now pay attention to the power dynamics at play. Saul had power and it wasn't enough. And Saul wanted more power. Thus, the peril of political power. Now, Jonathan had power, and Jonathan put down his power to promote David. And so, of course, David loved Jonathan because Jonathan's love was sacrificial. Jonathan put down his power, his position, his prestige, and his privilege to promote David. A passionate, personal power that sacrificed on David's behalf. So let me ask you, who has done that for you? Who has sacrificed on your behalf? Who has put down their power, their position, their prestige in order to promote your well-being and your welfare. And I wonder, friends, if you've ever taken the time to stop and thank them for their sacrifice on your behalf. Have you been able to say to that person who sacrificed for you, thank you, I love you, sister. I love you, brother. Because, friends, we in the church must not be shy about our brotherly and sisterly affection for one another. We've all been sacrificed for 
Have we said thank you? Second, for whom have you sacrificed? For whom have you laid down your power, your position, your prestige, and your privilege? When have you promoted someone else at great expense to yourself? And be careful. This is not a bilateral where I give to get. This is a unilateral where I give simply for the joy of giving. I sacrifice simply for the joy of sacrificing. Who has served you and whom have you served? When have you put down power, position, prestige, and privilege for the sake of someone else's well-being? We said earlier that the downside of power is that it is unchecked movement that forcefully positions for influence against resistance without thought to consequence and ends in a self-consuming rage. How might society be transformed if power gave way to sacrifice and selflessness? How might our families be transformed if power gave way to sacrifice and selflessness? How might our schools be transformed if power gave way to sacrifice and selflessness? How might corporations be transformed if power gave way to sacrifice and selflessness? How might politics be transformed if power gave way to sacrifice and selflessness? Friends, how might the church be transformed if power gave way to sacrifice and selflessness? How might you tomorrow be transformed if power gave way to sacrifice and selflessness? Now, friends, this is not hypothetical. This is not rhetorical. For followers of Jesus Christ, this is our explicit call. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus wasn't exaggerating. We are called to value sacrifice and service, and selflessness more than power and influence. And this was thematic for Jesus. In Mark chapter 10, he is on the road to Jerusalem to be crucified. He's just predicted his death for the third time. And what did James and John ask him? Jesus, can we have seats of power in the kingdom, which must have broken Jesus' heart. But he responds, verse 42, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. There is a way of power in the world that is dominance and authoritative and imposing. But Jesus continues, But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that, friends, is what Jesus did. He of highest power and highest privilege emptied himself of all to serve we who are unworthy and undeserving. Now, I want you to see with your own eyes how David's lament 
illustrates the extent to which this is majestically true. We'll see, finally, perfect providential power. We see in David's lament a straight road to the glory of the gospel of Jesus. If you read the first verses and the last verse together in David's lament, verse 19, your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places, how the mighty have fallen. Verse 27, how the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. And so, yes, understandably, David mourns. But he also looks ahead to a season of peace. Historically, Saul's death led to the unification and the strengthening of Israel under David. One could almost say that Saul's death was the means by which peace, strength, and unity was procured for the people of God. Now, come on. Who else do you know was slain on the high places? What other death perished the weapons of war? What other death promoted peace for the people of God? Now, tell me, why did Jesus leverage power in that way? Why did Jesus choose the path of death and sacrifice leading to life? What did Jesus say when face to face with Pilate in John 18? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Jesus did not pick up weapons of war, nor did his servants. Why? They did not fight as this world did because their kingdom is not of this world. And friends, that is our call as well, to live as people imbued with the power of God, but not to fight as this world fights. So what is the call to us then as followers of Jesus to live godly power? I want to close this morning with six attributes of godly power for those whose kingdom is not of this world. And the first is the availability. Friends, for whom is the power of God available? Who can receive the power of God? Romans 1 is clear. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God is available to everyone Do we live as though the power of God is available to everyone? Perhaps we believe that we are so far gone, so far stained by sin, there is no way that Jesus Christ can love us. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, including Me, the chief among sinners. Or the person with whom you disagree most ardently. The person who is most ideologically different from you. Do you live as though the gospel is the power of God for salvation to them? The power of God is available to everyone. Now, second, access. If all may receive the gospel, how do we actually receive godly power? If it is available for all, what is the means by which we actually do receive the power of God? 
Philippians 3, indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Do we want access to the power of God? Then count all things as loss. Lose hope in all images of worldly power and prestige. Lose hope in worldly vestments of power. Count it all as rubbish. And if we count worldly vestments of power as rubbish, there's only one place to turn. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. We receive godly power when we let go of our hope in worldly power. That is how we access godly power. Third, attitude. What does godly power look like when we are displaying godly power? What are its characteristics in our lives? But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Human weakness receives godly power. And so, godly power displayed is glorified in human weakness. And what is the consequence in our behavior of such human weakness and godly power? For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, we should presume that anything that smacks of worldly power is antithetical to godly power. Human weakness receives godly power. Fourth, action. What does godly power do? Promise this godly power. What do we do with it? For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. We are not given the power of God to sit by idly, but we are transformed God's power in us and through us to work around us for the glory of God. The power of God is effective in us and through us. Just how effective is it? Fifth, amplitude. How loud is godly power? How comprehensive? How large is godly power? How effective is it? Peter tells us, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Friends, there is nothing that is off limits to the power of God. Nothing in your heart, nothing in your mind, nothing in your job, nothing in the secret shadows. There is nothing that is off limits to the power of God. All things should be offered up to and be transformed by the power of God. Granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now such a position is vulnerable. Such a position requires transparency. Such a position requires trust in the power of God. And so sixth and finally then, what is our assurance that this way of life is worth it? What is our assurance, our confidence that trusting in God's power and relying on our weakness is worthy of our devotion? Finally, Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. See that. Jesus Christ had power, but he put it down. 
Jesus Christ had position, had prestige, had privilege, and he put it down. How far down did he put it? but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus put down his power to the point of death. And what is the end for Christ and what is our guaranteed end? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is our assurance that human weakness and godly power is worthy of our devotion. So friends, this week, I promise you, you will have an opportunity to attempt to get your way. You will have an opportunity to exert your influence, to try and achieve or accomplish something. And you will have the opportunity to rely on your own power and authority and influence, what you have accumulated for yourself, or you will have the opportunity to trust your weakness and the power of God. And friends, the question to all of us is, will we rely on our strength? Or will we joyfully accept our weakness and trust the power of God? Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks this morning for you are a powerful God. We give you thanks for the power of your word and for the power of your spirit. And we give you thanks for your sufficiency. Lord, we are unable to accomplish our results the way that we want them. And so we are dependent on you, God. Lord, you know what lays ahead of us this week. And we ask that you would affirm to us that our best path to a God-honoring, God-glorifying life is rejoicing in our weakness and trusting you and trusting you alone. Father, illuminate to us our tendencies to rely on our own strength and cause us to rejoice in trusting you. We give you thanks for Jesus, the powerful one who was slain on the high places on our behalf. We give you thanks, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. We are more than conquerors in him who loves us.
my friends. To those who have obtained, am I on? Can you hear me? Excellent. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Friends, such is God's power to you. And so go and be empowered.